next speaker would be will be Joe Tribia. Joe um, gave a talk as well in the colloquium, so thanks, Joe, for that. Whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Can everybody see my full screen? Because yes. Um, um, so uh, once again, I want to thank uh, the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak, and um, I'm going to uh, talk about a rather unorthodox idea as to why we don't do as well as we think we should do in the uh, sub-seasonal range, uh, just because uh, uh, the atmosphere uh, and the weather events within the sub-seasonal um, uh, time range uh, may be unpredictable for a reason that uh, I don't think has been explored very carefully at, at this point. So let me go on to uh, my talk. There we go. Okay. So as I said, I think the subseasonal range going on beyond week two is a, is a very challenging problem for uh, prediction. And uh, as you can see uh, from this uh, figure from the European Center in 2012, uh, uh, we can predict fairly well for, for one week. And we're just looking at anomaly correlation here of the geopotential height field. And uh, by 2012, we could predict uh, day seven, 500 hectopascal uh, height anomalies fairly well. Um, not perfectly, but well enough. But as you can see from this diagram, the skill drops off rather rapidly after seven days. And, and by 10 days, there's on average, absolutely no skill, uh, no useful skill uh, in the anomaly correlation of something as, as uh, benign as the 500 hectopascal uh, height field. So why can't we do better than this? And uh, typically the answer to that is uh, a turbulent cascade of error from small scale to large scale. In 69, uh, Lorentz uh, proposed uh, a diagram that looks somewhat like uh, this one on the left, where uh, uh, the time scale of smaller scale oscillations, smaller scale disturbances, smaller scale errors uh, was uh, was able to uh, traverse the spectrum uh, at a time that was smaller than for larger scales. So uh, very small scale errors uh, could propagate up to uh, uh, the 100 kilometer range in about an eighth of a day or a quarter of a day. So, um, uh, from this perspective, weather prediction becomes uh, very difficult after about one week, because after about one week, there's almost no skill left in the, in, in the prediction. Uh, but, and any skill that does exist is all in 
the large scale planetary scale waves, okay? Um, uh, a modified version of this argument, this, this argument used a three-dimensional turbulence closure scheme to estimate the predictability. And while the atmosphere on, on large scales is much more like a two-dimensional turbulent flow on smaller scales, and in fact, perhaps down at, at, to only down to the sub uh, synoptic scale, is it um, a two-dimensional turbulent flow? Beyond the subsynoptic scale, it behaves uh, with a power spectrum, uh, kinetic energy uh, spectrum that looks like a minus five-thirds, which is exactly the uh, energy spectrum for a three-dimensional turbulent flow. And so from this perspective, small scale errors um, can propagate up to the subsynoptic scale pretty quickly. So probably in about a day or so. And then uh, uh, the uh, two dimensional inverse cascade would take over and allow us to predict perhaps for a week, perhaps, uh, perhaps a bit longer out to 10 days, but not to uh, week three, which is kind of the first goal of uh, subseasonal prediction. Okay, so I'm going to propose an alternative to this inverse cascade of error. Um, and this was something that is motivated or uh, inspired by a surprise we had in some uh, fraternal, not identical twin experiments. So this is a fraternal twin experiment. Um, in the fraternal twin experiment, the model uh, simulation that is trying to predict it is not identical to the uh, models that are trying to predict it. And so um, in the early 2000s, Dave Baumhefner and I ran some experiments uh, using a high resolution version of the NCAR model at the time, uh, T170 as ground truth, and tried to predict it using uh, various coarser resolution versions of the NCAR model, T106, T63, T42. And we did all those uh, experiments uh, without any topography to, to not have to worry about the complication of topographic forcing in, in, in the problem, just to look at the kind of inertial effects on predictability, the uh, cascade of errors from unresolved scales into resolved scales. So um, uh, what we found was uh, that in fact, uh, things behaved kind of like we thought uh, it didn't take more than a half a day for uh, the unresolved scales to start growing. And uh, once they started, the resolved scales to start growing, excuse me, error in the resolved scales to start growing. And once they started growing, they started uh, growing uh, exponentially, much as you'd expect in a uh, quasi-geostrophic or uh, quasi-two-dimensional turbulent regime. However, one thing uh, we noticed that was kind of a surprise to us because we tried very carefully to input the exact uh, spectral initial conditions um, in the resolved scales of all four model integrations. So uh, to put the T170 uh, in uh, initial conditions into the T140, T42 um, model, all the way down to T42 and started. So you would expect that at T equals zero, there would be no uh, resolved scale energy. In fact, that uh, at T equals zero, no resolved scale errors at T equals zero. So how did that error get into the integrations when I told you exactly what we did. We put in exactly 
the um, initial conditions that the T170 model saw at T63 resolution and T106 resolution and T42 resolution? Well, the answer to that was that before integrating the model, it checked the model checked for static instability, okay? And in fact, spectrally truncated uh, uh, initial conditions can have different static stability, different uh, static stabilities um, at, a, at a point, uh, uh, quite commonly when you think about how a spectral model behaves, okay? And so, um, this was the T106 uh, temperature error at T equals zero, temperature difference at, at 500 millibars, 500 hectopascals that we saw uh, using the T170 initial conditions and allowing the system to do this uh, dry convective adjustment before it started integrating. At, 500 uh, at 500 has, hectopascals, you also see this difference in the height field. And what I want to point out to you is that this is the initial error caused by this convective adjustment. And what you can see is that there's quite a bit of energy at large scale and at small scale. And large scale and small scale here uh, was the difference between uh, wave number uh, 15 and everything else that, that evolved. And so uh, you can see that there's large scale uh, errors in there. And if, if you go back to the previous slide, excuse me, you can see the this energy spectrum at t equals zero is absolutely flat, okay? So this is the interesting uh, point that I want to point out, that this instability, this con dry convective adjustment cause is caused by a threshold nonlinearity. At one point, you change, you violate the threshold condition. And that violation at a point is localized in space, but because it's localized in space, it is very broad in uh, the spectral regime, in, in wave number space. And so you put in uh, a delta-like uh, forcing in the initial condition, a delta-like condition caused by violating the threshold uh, at a particular point, and the threshold nonlinearity spreads that that influence out over all spatial scales. So it acts not as a, a rather slow inertial cascade from smaller scale to large scale. It acts as an instantaneous cascade, contaminating both small scales and large scales. Okay, so a possible a example of this is shown by uh, the, the April 10, 2011 uh, dropout bust, which was studied um, in the Tiggy regime and Rod Mark Rodwell did a, uh, and uh, a host of other people did a, a very nice study of what was going on in dropouts over the European, yeah, European domain and up above, you see the, the rapid decline in the correlation score uh, around April 10th uh, in the 500 hectopascal on, um, anomaly correlation skill score. And what you can see uh, below is the kind of verification that's common for European sector bus, at least in the, in the ECMWF system. So this is the common uh, 500 hectopascal anomaly um, that comes out of a composite of uh, bus situations over uh, about 30 years time, 30 years of samples. And so what I wanna point out is that associated with the uh, height anomalies in, in that composite, and this is 
Um, there's also a cape anomaly associated with that, that <clears throat> composite. And in the particular case of the April 10th, the cape um, initial uh, uh, conditions uh, are shown here. And you can see there's quite a strong cape anomaly, both uh, around the upper Midwest and uh, on the East Coast of the United States. This leads to, in fact, uh, precipitation anomalies, um, uh, both forecast and the observed precipitation anomalies. And the observed precipitation anomalies are, in fact, quite a bit stronger than um, the uh, forecast precipitation anomalies. And precipitation condensation is exactly this kind of threshold nonlinearity. And condensation at a point where in a localized region can lead to um, an anomalous errors, not just in this region where the forcing is, uh, where the anomalous precip is, where the anomalous precip errors are, but downstream and upstream because uh, it causes this instantaneous cascade from small scale to large scale. So now I just want to ask if we can see this in a simplified setting. And Joe, so, maybe in a minute, if you could. Yep, yeah, I will quit. I'll be done in a second. So what we saw, uh, we did some experiments with the moist shallow water equations, which have an on off thresh threshold instability, showed that, in fact, you do see this instantaneous cascade in the moist spectral evolution. You don't see it in a dry spectral evolution. And I'm going to skip this because it's a little too hard to explain in a short period of time and move to my um, conclusions. So my conclusion is uh, a, a somewhat unorthodox explanation because history and tradition views quadratic nonlinearity in hydrodynamics as the root cause of chaos and unpredictability. In reality, this mechanism can be quite slow uh, when compared to threshold nonlinearity inherent in the phase changes of water. This is particularly so when one examines spatial scale interactions, so you get an instantaneous cascade. And this may, in fact, limit accurate subseasonal forecasting, in particular, to forecasts of, forecasts of weather, to the forecast, uh, only a forecast of opportunity, and not into uh, a more general uh, ability to forecast at the subseasonal range. And I'll end there and take questions. Thanks a lot, Joe. Great point and a great <laughs> talk. I don't see any questions or hands raised yet, Joe. So I had a question in terms of <clears throat> being able to reduce this error that comes from the moist physics. Do you think we need to get into convection resolving regime yeah. <clears throat> for models or is it at all possible with stochastic physics and parameterized convection? So um, I think all of these will have some limitations associated, in, in my opinion. Uh, fact is, uh, we'll be limited to how well in convecting re resolving um, situations, how well can resolve uh, the exact location of convection. Right now, when we do uh, mesoscale prediction at convection uh, resolving scales, we oftentimes allow ourselves the um, opportunity to say, well, the convection is not quite in the right spot or it's, it's delayed a bit in time. Those errors in time and space will lead once again to this kind of instantaneous cascade as will errors in parameterized convection and errors uh, uh, 
uh, input uh, by stochastic parameterization. So I don't think there's an easy way around this problem. Um, it's, a, it's a fundamental nature of the high order nonlinearity associated with uh, kind of threshold nonlinearities. Great. Um, great. Thanks a lot again for the talk, Joe. And uh, we'll have more questions during the interaction networking sessions later in the week. So great.